Today is February 27th, and we're reading from Luke chapter 6. Jesus now is uh, entering into territory that is causing a lot of conflict. He is disrupting the status quo of religious traditions. So the uh, fact is he's beginning to minister and to help people on the Sabbath day. Now, uh, the, we understand that the Sabbath law is basically one of the Ten Commandments. But over the time, uh, men started to create rules, specific uh, expectations of that law in application to how you can conduct yourself. So they made a whole list of of man-made rules pertaining to the Sabbath. Jesus is making it clear that, hey, Sabbath was made for the benefit of you and I, that you and I could experience a certain time of rest and uh, that we'd be able to be, get away to be alone with God. And so uh, he, begin, he heals on the Sabbath day. And uh, this causes tremendous indigestion in the religious leaders. In fact, it says that they watched him closely whether he would heal on the Sabbath. Isn't it remarkable that here you got people that are terribly sick and probably some of them have been in suffering for a long time and yet the concern of the religious crowd is whether he's going to try to help them. And so the Bible says there in the, um, in the, in the sixth, seventh verse, uh, eighth verse, he knew their thoughts. Now this is kind of neat that Jesus knowing the thoughts of the religious crowd went ahead and he did it and he answers the question this ought to bring great comfort to you god knows all things jesus was never taken by surprise by any of uh, these things that happened and so he knew their thoughts and he addressed uh, their uh, misgivings about really that this issue of the sabbath and he declares that the lord jesus is even lord of the, of, the, of the Sabbath. And so there he stretches out his hand. He touches this man. The man is marvelously healed. He's restored. And uh, look in verse 11, and they were filled with rage. Isn't it incredible that there can be so much tradition, so much religion, so much arrogance, so much, uh, you know, desire for your own system that when you see something so fantastic, so miraculous, you still are so hard that you can't enter into a sense of the excitement of something unbelievable that's happened. No, they were filled with rage because their own territory was being uh, invaded and they thought they were losing power. Um, and so in spite of the miracle, they are enraged. While Jesus goes up into the mountain, he's praying. As we see in the 12th verse, he spends an entire night praying. What's he praying about? He's, choosing, he's praying that God would direct him and show him who's going to be the 12 that will be part of his, uh, his disciples, his, his discipleship team. And uh, he continued all night in prayer about this. And I think this demonstrates how important it is for you and I making decisions that we seek God for divine direction. If Jesus, the Son of God, needed to do this, how much more you and I need to do the same. The Bible tells us in the 17th verse <clears throat> that Jesus heals all kinds of people. I mean, the multitudes are coming to be touched by him. And um, it says that they came to hear him and be healed of their diseases. So they're, they're both captivated by the things that he's, he's saying because he's, his words are full of life. And they're coming so that they might be delivered from these terrible diseases that they have. I love the fact that the Bible says that as uh, uh, that these, when God, these tormenting spirits, unclean spirits, that, that they were healed, they were delivered. Just come in the presence of Jesus. Look what it says, and the whole multitude sought to touch him for power went out from him and healed them all. Now, this thing about that, there was an, a Shekinah power glory that was just flowing through Jesus, just like the woman with issue blood said, if I touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made well. While well, Jesus carried this glory presence everywhere he went. You know, I believe that you and I can also experience this. We are supposed to be walking in the greater works. Greater works than these, Jesus said, you will do. And, and I long for this. I, I'm mindful of this. I want to live such intimacy, with such intimacy with God that I might also carry that kind of glory presence so that wherever I go, I carry his miracle power with me. Then we're introduced to the Beatitudes again, these marvelous promised blessings that give secrets of insights of how you can have a fulfilled, happy life. Really blessed means happy, fulfilled. And he gives us these, uh, these cues. And then Jesus 
also declares woes. He's giving blessings on the one hand, but he's, he's warning that, hey, woe is going to come in your life to these individuals. And look what he says in, in the 24th, 5th, and 6th verse. It says, the woe is woe to the rich, woe to the full, woe when you laugh now, woe when men speak well of you. And all these things, he's, he's contrasting between an earthly, temporal system and the kingdom of God, of which when we get a hold of these inner movements of God, look in that previous verse up there uh, in the 22nd verse. Notice how it says that when, when all this bad happens to you and I because we live in a fallen world, he says, uh, when they uh, hate you, when they exclude you, when they revile you and, and cast you out, your name is evil uh, for the Son of Man's sake. Look what it says. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. I mean, think about that. Why? Uh, because your reward is going to be great in heaven. You are, you are sons and daughters of the king. You're not of this system, this world system. You are of an eternal kingdom. And you and I hang on to uh, where we know we're heading. Uh, for the promised rewards. And then Jesus gives us this upside down kingdom that is, contradicts the natural tendencies of our human nature. That someone hurts us, we want to hurt back. We want to strike back. If they're, we're offended, we want to offend back. And, um, and, and the law said, you know, an eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth. But Jesus is coming to show us uh, a different take on this. He talks about loving your enemies and doing good to those who hate you and uh, those who curse you and, and that you and I are to pray for those who uh, spitefully treat us uh, in, in, a, in a, or just do things to us that are is, is spiteful. And uh, if you're struck on one side, turn to the other one. And all of these things that Jesus talks about, and, and if you're asked to do something, do this. And, and I mean, it, it's all things. This is the golden rule. This is, this is something you can't do in your own power. But God is saying, you and I, uh, need to love our enemies and we need to pray for those who persecute us and 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 this is the laws of the kingdom and and all of this produces eternal rewards now we may not reap the rewards here we will reap some of them here because we'll reap the rewards of obeying God but the fact is that many of these will be later and uh, he says uh, love your enemies verse 38 do good uh, lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you'll be sons of the Most High. Then he says this, for he is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore, be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. So what it's saying here is that, listen, God is good even to the people that are evil. That in this world we live in, that uh, the rain falls on the just and the unjust, and the sun is, you know, is benefited by all people. And just as God is merciful, not that he's tolerating it in the sense of excusing it, but rather that God is merciful because he wills that none would perish but all come to repent, so that we're supposed to have that same kind of love and regard for other people. Then he warns us about not judging. You know, don't, don't judge, don't... Uh, don't uh, condemn other people, uh, but uh, love people. Love, uh, love those that are around you. And, and he brings that down by talking about how easy it is for you and I to see the imperfections in other people. It deals with this in the 39th verse. And that is that sometimes we want to take and clear the speck that's in one, someone else's eye that we see, that speck that's there. You know, a little flake that flies in the eye, and we want to correct that. Well, all along, we have this plank or log in our own eyes. And so this is the challenge of human nature. We oftentimes dismiss our own fra uh, frailties and flaws, and we want to help other people when before we actually take care of the issues in our own life. And so what Jesus is saying here, listen, take care of the log that is in your own eye, the beam that's in your own eye. Then you'll be able to see to help your brother that's a helpful aspect to get the speck out of their eye. That is for you and I, the uh, high road of the Christian life is our attitude to those other of those people around us. And then Jesus talks about uh, this aspect of tree known by its fruit and how we build our house, that is our lives on the rock of Jesus Christ. And um, Jesus says here something uh, that, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do the things I tell you to do? He's actually astonished that there are people there that are saying, Lord, Lord, but they're not living. They're not obeying him. And uh, so he gives this analogy about someone whose 
house is built on the rock. Well, we know the rock is Jesus. The foundation is set upon Christ. And to have that set upon Christ, we're going to do everything he tells us to do. And then he talks about someone who's, whose house is built on sand. You know, there's no foundation whatsoever. And then it speaks about when the storms come. And the fact is, it's not a matter of if, but the storm is going to come for the house that's built on the rock as much as for the house that's built on the sand. But, but he's sharing here that there's going to be a great difference in the outcome when you and I base our life upon the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ and that incorporated with doing everything that he tells. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things that I tell you to do? And uh, so you and I must base our life upon the authority of God and the kingdom of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, listen, I pray today, may you make Jesus Christ the foundation of this day. And may you rest upon him, may your hope be in him, and may whatever storm you may be facing today, may you be reminded you're not going down, you're founded upon the solid rock of the Lord Jesus Christ.